Um, my name is David McConaughey, and um, yeah, I'm just to talk to you about what lot feeders want. So it's a bit of a broad topic, and I'll go into a few other aspects of it as well as we go. Um, just a quick briefing about my family's business, Hopkins River Pastoral Company. We uh, own and operate a few different models under that umbrella. We've got Hopkins River Beef, which was first established back in 1996. Um, that was as a, as a way of getting our product direct to the customer, and we still do that today. We have our own sales and marketing team based in Melbourne. Uh, there's Hopkins River Feedlot and Farms. So we, um, the feedlot was established in 1994, and that was really built around getting the grain-fed product to market. Uh, and the farms are basically used for backgrounding for the feedlot and also to do a grass-fed product from the months of sort of August through to December. Um, another arm to that is Hopkins River Compost. Through the feedlot system, we obviously get a lot of manure. We build a whole system around that. We make our own humified compost for ourselves and also selling it to markets and other farmers, bulk, director, landscape, architects in Melbourne. And we've also just broken a deal with Coles. So the first bag put in the bagging facility, and the first bags went into Coles about a month ago. <coughs> My view of the role of the feedlot, I think if the feedlot industry is one of the very few intensive industries that has the, has the ability to be able to produce a quality product, also in quantity. Um, it's rare for that if you grain feed lamb and other things like that, it actually hinders the quality of the product, whereas in beef it probably makes it better and more consistent. So we've got, a, we've got an important role to play within the, within the greater industry. A lot of what we do is built on relationships. I think relationships are the most important thing that any of us can have through the whole supply chain, right from paddock to plate. It's all about a relationship. You know, in our personal business, we've got a fantastic relationship with Coles Supermarkets. It's, it's allowed us to come up with our own co-branded product uh, called the Coles Finest Hopkins River Beef Label, going into four states. Um, it's also through that association, it's allowed us, with our relationship with Coles, to get our direct access for our compost into 10 litre bags. Without that association and good relationship with those guys, that wouldn't have happened. And a lot of people say to me, how do you go dealing with coals? You know, they're bastards, they're this, they're that. If you take away the coals umbrella, using them as an example, they're just people, they've got families. You build a relationship with the people within the organisation and then you can build a business. And I think that's extremely important. Livestock suppliers to, to feedlots. You know, building alliances is extremely strong and invaluable for a feedlot system. Um, often built on trust, you know, that creates, you know, so that creates direct access. We have trust with a lot of suppliers. Some guys, we don't expect their cattle anymore. They hardly even ask a price. There's one guy that delivers his cattle. When he drives away, he asks what the price is. That's built on trust and it's a great relationship. And every feedlot in Australia is always looking for those sorts of relationships. They're hard to establish, you know, that's because often markets can change and and once again, it's built on trust. So if you lose that trust, then those markets aren't established. And history, history often gets in the way. We find, you know, a lot of, a lot of people have sold in the same sale for generations. They've always sold in the Hamilton first wiener sale and that's what they're always going to do. Um, you know, from our point of view, that's not the best, that's not the best system. If we could avoid sale yards 100% of the time, we could, uh, but we can't. We can't get the numbers that we need to, uh, to feed our system. So, you know, that's really a pretty important role and one relationship we think which couldn't get stronger over the years is between farmers like yourselves and feedlotters. So benefits of the relationship, uh, information flow. How do, how do breeders improve without information? Um, you know, if cattle are lost in the system, the information is lost. So that's where I keep coming back sounding anti-sale yards, but as far as we're concerned, we only track cattle as a sale yard. So if they come from Wodonga, they're lost in Wodonga. They might come from eight different properties, but they're based on Wodonga. So information flow then can't go back, can't go back to the farmer. You know, and if you look at the feedlot and processing industry on top of that, you know, I think that to be critical of them, information is often blocked um, because they're worried it's going to be used against them. And then, you know, so someone can ring around and say, well, my cattle went to JBS Tabata and they did this many kilos a day, so what are you going to give me for them? And 
you know, I think that's, uh, but I think the more information we can get back, and MSA is another one which can get more information right back through to the consumer. So, you know, and on top of that, it's once after information, it's really got to be a, a win win or a lose lose in a direct relationship. Uh, a lot of people are always looking for a premium. They're probably, I don't really like that word, there isn't really a premium out there. There is a, a good deal for someone who's prepared to do the right job. Um, you know, I think being prepared to negotiate and build that relationship and that's invaluable. And then that becomes, we always say to guys, we've got a list of people who have preferred supply that will put other people back if they want to sell us cattle. And in times like this, that can be invaluable. You know, in Queensland and northern New South Wales, there's people who've got to book cattle in six weeks ahead to get a kill in dry times. You know, you can't even get a truck. Well, in times like this, to have preferred supplier status with an off-taker, that proves to be invaluable, and I think that's where a lot of the premium sits. Service providers to the cattle industry are also extremely important. All the guys you know you see out there with their products, keeping up to date with information, technology is constantly changing. Ten years ago, most of us were using pens and paper, and we were still putting tail tags on cattle. You know, look at how technology's come, performance recording, all those sorts of things, and that can then link back to the information flow. So. Now, keeping up with those guys, the, the drug companies here, the diseases, you know, we look in our feedlot, six years ago we'd never seen a case of bovine respiratory disease. Now it's the most evident, evident disease within the feedlot, in, in the feedlot industry. I've got a slide later about that. So, you know, that's really important to keep up to date with technology. Uh, the public, another relationship, without them none of us have got a business. It doesn't matter at what level, at what level of the supply chain we've got, we're all producing a product that ends up on someone's plate. They've got the final say, you know, their wallets are on the line. If, if they don't like what they're hearing about livestock production or beef production, well, they're not going to buy it. You know, I think the feedlot sector's done a lot in the last two to three years um, with its public relations, being more involved in social media and trying to portray some good messages. We've probably got the best code of conduct in the world for a feedlot industry. Um, you know, animal husbandry is now becoming more and more important and a lot of emphasis being put on that. Uh, so all those things are, are really, really important to the, to the greater, greater good of the industry and, and luckily that gap is closing slowly. It's not like a live export disaster where the gap, the gap was forced shut by uh, third party people. It's actually slowly being, there's more customer awareness and public awareness coming around. I think that's important. Employees, I've just thrown this one in here, it's important to have a good relationship with your employees because they are your business. If you employ people, you know, they, they're wearing your name on their shirt, well, they, they're putting you forward. And in our, with all of our guys, we try to find common interests. We have clay shoots and fishing and that sort of thing, you know, to have a good relationship. A lot of people feel it's too hard to get too close, but you've got to be close enough to be in touch with them and their lives, so then they feel like, they're going to want to do more for you. This is my little uh, pet hate slide <coughs> about sale yards. Sale yards equal stress, hands down. Uh, animal husbandry and animal handling, in my opinion, I think in many people's opinion, if you sit back and actually watch, is extremely poor. Rushing, pushing, hitting. You know, how many times you see when it gets to the pen that they're going to sell and someone jumps in the pen and starts hitting the cattle to get them to spin? spinning them on the concrete, you know, in, from my point of view it's terrible and if we can get, if we go, not all, I'm not saying this is across the board, not all sale yards, but if I'm at a sale yard buying cattle and have a choice on pens of cattle and we're not pushed for numbers, you walk, walk away from the pen that that happens to, time and time again, because it's just not up to scratch. Cattle are off feed too long, you know, often they're off feed for 48 hours. You know, and that's in southern, southern Australia, northern Australia even longer. And there's, I can't remember off the top of my head the science, but it's something like for every 24 hours off feed, it takes you five to seven days to get them back to the point they were before they went off feed. So in the feedlot industry, where we've got on a timeline and on a budget, it's almost impossible to make money out of those cattle unless you can buy them cheaper. And that's why they often are cheaper. We often have a five to 10 cent premium for cattle coming direct off farm purely because of that reason and in our system we rest all sale yard cattle for two to four weeks 
If you put an adjustment cost on that, it's $16 a head. If you put an extra freight on that, it's often an extra five to 10. You're getting up to $30 a head, which is 10 cents. And that's expensive. And the whole industry has got to swallow that. And then the word about premium comes back. Well, that's where the premium gets swallowed up for the people trying to do the right job because there is a cost associated with the sale yards. Market types uh, for cattle. So there's a, in the feedlot industry, there's a big shift away from the long fed industry, your 300 day plus typical Rangers Valley industry. Um, you know, shorter feeding regimes, trying to finish cattle quicker. Domestic strong is strong at the moment. Export's tough because of many factors. Um, you know, I think people need to be trying to breed for market type. If the feedlot is your, what you're aiming for, well, you know, if you're aiming for a domestic feedlot, someone feeding for coals or woolies, you know, the domestic article intake is three to 400 kilos in, in round numbers. So you need to be breeding towards that and they're gonna want them finished and dead at about 240, 250 kilos carcass weight, which is, you know, in your mid to high four, four to early 500. So the export feeder, your typical JBS feeder, DSA, that's your four to 500 kilos, not to two teeth, sort of, you know, that 18 to 20 month old type article. If you're breeding for a backgrounder, so through the typical store sales in the south here, you know that sort of the feedlot backgrounder is going to need to buy them between 220 and 330 kilos because he's got to turn them off in the four to 500. Um, and a bullock fattener, your typical Gippsland type guys, they want them 300 to 360. Um, and that's really, that's our market in our own feedlot. We're 320 to 380, so that's uh, that's sort of the, the the roundabouts of market types and a lot of people always say to me, what do I look for in cattle when buying? And I always say beef. You know, you're looking for what, what I see an animal when it's hanging up on the chain and boned out and saleable meat yield. You know, and that's the most important thing in the whole chain. So if, to us, an extra 10 or $20 a head on the live weight is minimal. If we can get an extra, the, the right kilos in the, in the right places on the carcass and get an extra five or six kilos of saleable meat, well, that can be 80, 100, $200 a head depending on where the meat is. So that's the most important. And that's where that, you gotta to try to think the whole supply chain, where's that animal gonna end up? Understanding your market, you know, work towards what it wants. If it's feedlot, background, at grass fed, coals, woolies, you know, really try to understand what they want. Have knowledge of your customer. I've got customer underlined there because I think there's often, you know, misconceptions that a lot of Farmers, I probably sound like I'm being a bit critical, I see it from both sides of the fence, but if I'm buying cattle from a, from a farmer, I'm his customer. However, it often seems like the boot's on the other foot. The, the farmer often say, what can you do for me? Or what, what can you do for this? The, we're the customer, we're buying the cattle, and that's where probably livestock agents get in the middle and make the farmer and the feedlot feel like they're both the customers. You know, so have knowledge of your customer and what are their targets? What, how long do they feed their cattle for? What age do they want them? Do they want the milk teeth, nought to two? What are their weight targets? What are their fat targets? What are they looking for? What market are they after? What type of animal? Do their grids change? You know, a lot of grids do change through the year. People might lift a grid running into the winter months by 10 to 20 kilos. They might drop it off in the spring because cattle are coming in on the front foot. So you really got to understand really what your customer wants and have a backup market in mind because as we know in this industry, things can change pretty quickly and um, you know, you really got to try to cover your bases. Just run through feeding regimes quickly of, a, of the NFIS or the feedlot accreditation scheme. So you've got your GFYG, which is grain fed young. Uh, that's really a 70 day article, 60 days for heifers because they get fatter quicker. And that's very much your domestic feeding regime. It's your coals, your woolies. And if anybody's ever feeding for a domestic butcher, generally they're feeding them for their 60 to 70 days. The short fed market, um, that's, that's our 100% market. And a lot of feedlots are now targeting that market. That's 100 plus days. For anything to actually be labeled as grain fed beef, it has to be fed for a minimum of 100 days on feed. <coughs> Um, and that, a lot of that's exported and that, a lot of that's what you see in the food service industry. Middle fed, there's a less, bit less of this getting around now. That's 150 to 180 days. I know JBS do some of that down <coughs> here, but generally that's just your short fed animal fed a bit longer. So it's a very similar market. Then your long fed, which is 300 plus days, which I mentioned before, that's the, your typical Rangers Valley 
type article, and that was really built around the Japanese and the high quality market, which is which is under under fire at the moment. And then a one of late's really the supplementary fed market. Um, a lot of feedlots, and I know a lot of the bigger processors in Australia now are feeding cattle for 30 to 50 days just to finish them. They're not certificate, certificated. <clears throat> They're still technically sold as grass-fed because there's no classification for it. Um, and in dry times like this, that's what you'll find a lot of people do. I know a lot of us, and us in particular as well, found it hard to finish your sort of domestic bullocks running into Christmas last year with sort of an early cut out of a spring. Well, that's where a lot of feedlots filled up basically on this 30 to 50 day feeding regime just to put enough fat cover on to make the cattle killable. Preparation for market really depends on your market but these are just, this is all from, from our, my company's point of view. Feed lot of background are we like cattle drafted at least a week before loading. If you've got good quiet cattle maybe on the day but generally you've got to know what numbers you've got so we like them a, a week before. We always like cattle loaded full. Um, that's win-win. We always most people are paid on empty weight, so you're better off loading your cattle full. Uh, the livestock operators, transport operators, never like that. They want them loaded empty, um, but not from our point of view because it's all about time off feed. They may not travel quite as well once they get in the rhythm, and especially on a longer haul, they will. Um, so you know that that's our preference. Keep cattle off concrete for as long as possible. That's a pet hate, just as bad as sale yards, and that's why I don't like sale yards because of the concrete issue. Um, you know, foot soreness, toe abscesses, all those things, you know, really cost, I know it costs us a lot of money, I know it costs the feedlot industry a lot of money. Um, if you're sending cattle to abattoirs, it's based on a lot of trialling we did four or five years ago. Um, draft cattle either on the day or at least three days prior. If possible, you really want cattle off feed for no less than 24 hours. So it's often good to know your booking time slot for the next day. If you're first on the, first on the kill, six o'clock, you know, you, well, you know you can work towards that. If your cattle aren't going to be knocked until lunchtime, we'll try to load them in the afternoon. But that, once again, depends on how far you're sending them and, and curfew times and cut-off times for that abattoir. Um, transportation I've got here. It's just, a, you know, reputable carriers can actually make you money, even if they do cost a little bit more. Um, you know, it's, they're the last point of contact you guys have with your customer. If you send a cowboy into the feedlot and one bloody slips over or comes off and breaks its leg or they're mad or hits them with a prod or too many times and they come off mad, well that's, that's on you as much as it is on the livestock carrier. And that note will go against your cattle and that carrier. So often, you know, cheap is not always better. You like them to get there alive. You've got a transport operator carrying 85, maybe $100,000 worth of cattle, well that's a lot of money for the sake of an extra 10 or 20 cents a K. You know, it can be cheap in the long run and we often say pride, if they've got pride in the truck and the truck's clean and they really, you know, love that sort of thing, which those sort of guys do, well, they're generally gonna look after your cattle too. If they roll in and the truck's unwashed and it's a dust bucket and there's muck all over the floor, well, you know, if he doesn't look after himself, what's he gonna do with your cattle? Uh, handling. Minimise stress where possible. You know, nobody's cattle yards are perfect, but your attitudes can be. You know, how cattle are handled through their whole development affects the end product. Um, you know, and there's a lot of work been done with Temple Grand, and I actually got to meet Temple Grand in America last year. If you don't know of her, she's definitely worth looking up. I believe she's actually coming out to Australia this year for the feedlot conference. Um, you know, but less noise. After meeting her, I implemented straight away an hour cattle yard system, no noise. Um, we even we run a hydraulic system, we even move the, the pumps and everything even further away. Minimal noise, if the boys want to talk to each other, try to make them whisper. Um, you know, because noise, every time you say something, you notice an animal, they're, they're listening, they're conscious of where we are. And if we make a noise and hit them and spin them, it just equals stress, stirs them up. And if you happen to be running them up the race to weigh them, they will remember that the next time you go to run them up the race that that was a stressful time for them and they won't want to run again next time and then the cycle is created for their whole, for their whole life. And, you know, it's just, it's interesting small things I picked up from her, how she's saying if you hit an animal on the back with a stick, you know, if you ever walk up and touch an animal on the back with a stick, its whole back twitches and they move and that's the nerve endings and they say it's actually a very sensitive area for animals. 
you know, and just to even give them that tap with a stick, that just creates, instantly creates stress and puts them on edge and they no longer trust you. So animal handling is getting more and more important and it's directly linked to animal husbandry. I think we're going to hear more and more about this in the future. Weaning, um, all cattle should be weaned. You know, I think, does it matter what type of weaning? Not really. Uh, there's a lot of fence line weaning, yard weaning. You know, not in that business, but I think whatever works for your system is best. You know, I was just up in the New England recently and one fellow was saying to me that he can't yard wean. He's in 80 inch rainfall or, you know, his yards are going to get mucky, it creates problems. So they fence line wean. That works well for their system, it might not for you. One week weaning isn't enough. You know, what's one week? Is that three to four days or is it seven or eight? You know, so one week's not enough. Ideally, three to four weeks, you know, is preferred as a minimum. Um, if done correctly, cattle shouldn't lose weight. That was always the argument for years. I don't want to wean my calves because I'll lose weight. Well, of course they'll lose weight if you wean them one week before sale because they spend their whole time running around the paddock losing weight. Once they start sitting down and chewing their cud, that's when they'll start putting weight back on again. Um, and I think the majority of people are now weaning. We've noticed through the, the weaner sales now, three or four years ago, you walk into a weaner sale and you could hear it from 300 k's away. Now you walk in and generally it's pretty quiet and most people are doing the right job. Stress less, probably don't have spoken enough about that, but you know, feedlots have only got two to four months to make their return on the cattle. You might have bred them, for, bred them and grown them for 15 to 18 months, you know, two to four months isn't long to turn them around. We need cattle going forward straight away. Um, you know, any setbacks, and that, that just basically chews into feedlots profits. Um, got to your pre-treatment programs. You know, the, ju the jury's out in our feedlot about pre-treatment for respiratory and those sorts of things. Have no doubt though for pre-treatment of worm drenches and five-in-ones and things before feedlot arrival, the less that we can do to them on the induction process, I believe, the better. Once again, it's minimising stress after an already stressful event by being transported maybe for the first time. Got, just got a slide here. This is from MLA, um, the cost of bovine respiratory disease to the feedlot industry. Bovine respiratory is very much a stress-borne disease. It's estimated to cost the feedlot industry $40 million annually through loss of average daily gain, uh, worsened feed conversion efficiency, so feed conversion efficiency is the amount of feed they eat compared to the, the weight gain they put on, so it's directly associated to the loss of gain. Treatment and labour costs, um, probably one of the best drugs out there for bovine respiratory is uh, Adraxin, which is Pfizer or Zeotis now, and that's, um, you know, it's $30, 30 to $40 a shot but it's a one-shot wonder. Um, but you know, that's expensive if you've got to treat 5% of your cattle with that. Uh, mortality, you know, it's, it accounts for 66% of morbidity, so morbidity is treatment costs of cases, and it also accounts for 53% of mortality cases. So that's one disease accounts for more than 50%, and that's where that 40 million really comes in. <coughs> MSA, can it have value? Um, you know, I think it will in time. You know, especially through the feedlot industry, feedlot can actually supply a quality product 52 weeks of the year. Um, you know, so I think hopefully through a bit more consumer awareness and things like that, it will. Will it be passed back to producers? Well, once again, you come back to your relationship. If it can be, if your cattle can be measured through the system, and yes, they do improve, and yes, they do hit lower boning groups and grade well through MSA or well, through that relationship, I would hope in time that um, you know, that can create, can create extra, extra profits right through the chain and hopefully that can be shared right through the chain. You know, MSA underpins be best practice management. It's built around stress, it's built around time off feed, commingling of cattle, it's all about drafting cattle early. You know, so the principles of it also apply at all levels of production, without a doubt. You know, so just because we only see it once they're hanging on the rail, that is the same at every level, every sale and every transaction the principles apply. Um, just got the, does the consumer understand it? Probably not. I think most people don't. You know, it's only in the last couple of years I think I've really started to understand it. And we've been grading cattle now for four years. Um, you know, they do understand quality. They've got the final say. You know, they're the ones putting the wallet on the line. The supermarkets are now embracing it. Woolworths have come out and they're actually labelling everything MSA. 
Coles are actually using all the science of MSA, but just not, not certificating them. Um, the risk to MSA is, I believe, is widening the goalposts, trying to get more cattle to grade into lower boning groups. Once we start doing that, I think it'll draw away from the premium of the product. There's only a certain amount of beef which can be value added domestically. There's only so many people that can afford to pay for better beef. Um, I think if we just start flooding the market with what we think is better, 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 well then all of a sudden there's going to be no premium for, the, for what truly is the premium product. I uh, just got here quickly, just this sort of ties into what I'm talking about MSA, is the USA grid system versus the Australian grid system. So in Australia we work on a discount grid system. You know, if you say you're getting $3.50 is the bullseye for a, for a kill price, and then, well that's the top and then we start taking off a discount. So the US type system is a base plus grid. You get your base product, your base price, and then if they grade higher, you get paid more for it. So there's actually more incentive there for someone to try to do the better job. Uh, there's a company I visited over there called US Premium. They're a fully integrated producer-owned beef processing system. So basically producers own units. There's only X amount of units can be graded through US Premium. Um, and that gives them the opportunity to retain right through to the retail end of the business. So they can actually retain the, the profits and loss of that uh, that carcass right through to the supermarket tray. Um, you know, there's a lot of guys I know over there like Angus breeders, bull breeders, who are actually doing deals where they're buying back their progeny and then putting them into custom feed lots and then putting them through the US premium grid because they believe that if they can breed a better bull which will breed better progeny, that then they can also make money out of it as well. So it's really, I think, it's trying to encourage people to do better. Just a quick slide about advocating agriculture. I know Denise is talking about this next, but you know we've all got an interesting story to tell. Social media is, you know, getting out of control, and we saw what it did to the live export type of scenario. You know, it is scary. If we it's power in numbers, you know, do encourage people to try. You don't necessarily have to be actively be actively involved, but probably sign up. Follow Meat and Livestock Australia, follow, you know, Alpha, those sort of people. Because it's sort of like a follow is like a vote. And people really only ever look at the numbers. You know, US agriculture is continually behind. They're really under fire and fighting from behind. I think in Australia we're probably still in front. But the only way to keep in front is to keep moving with the times. Just a final message, you know, our commodity is food. You know, what we collectively what we collectively produce ends up on someone's plate and that's often forgotten at every link. Someone, when you breed an animal, no matter how many times it gets sold, someone in this world is going to end up with what you produce on their plate. You know, I think we'd just never try to lose sight of that. Thanks. Thanks very much, David. We've got a couple of minutes for uh, any questions. Anyone in the audience have any questions? John. Typical. Introduce <laughs> yourself if you can. Yes. Yeah, morning, David. John Conlon, the Central website. Um, you're interested in your slide showing um, the impact of BRD on the industry. Yeah. Are, are you yet at a point where you are encouraging suppliers to do pre feedlot entry vaccinations for BRD? Uh, and if so, are you, getting, are you able to measure the impacts of that in terms of lower drug use and less morbidity, more mortality? Yeah. And my second question um, is, um, we do a, a, a frequent uh, feedlot break even and a trading budget on, on Bee Central. And part of that, uh, which we monitor very closely, is uh, cost of gain. And uh, uh, typically, our current cost of gains in our model are about $2.20 uh, per kilo of body weight gain. Yep. And I know there are times when your feedlot, and Sandy gives me the information, and, uh, southern feedlots can do considerably better than what we can do in the north. Um, so my point is, um, uh, is particularly uh, the how much impact would um, improvement in, in feed efficiency, say a ten yeah. percent improvement across the board, have on your cost of gain, which is a critical driver of feedlot profitability and performance. I mean, um, how much impact would uh, would feed, uh, a ten percent increase in feed conversion, and perhaps also a, a similar gain in Average daily gain have on your 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 business model. Yeah, well, 
answer your last question first, you know, that's huge. Any feedlot industry is such a geared industry. You know, most feedlots are working towards making 20 to $50 a head, you know, at best, on an animal that can be worth a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars. So to get any ten percent efficiency, whether it be through cost of gain, feed efficiencies, is huge. Um, average daily gain is massive. You're talking point. Give you off the top, maybe you're talking point one kilo per day in a hundred day animal. That's ten kilos live, which is let's say fifty percent yield, which is better that. That's five kilos dead. That animal is worth four dollars a kilo. There's twenty dollars a head. There's your margin, right there. So any any gain on that, and that's if an animal does 1.7 to 1.8, you know, so it's not even 10%. So anything like that is huge. Um, come back to your pre-treatment question. We've done a lot of work in our feed on the early years in pre-treatment. We can't quantify it. We don't encourage our producers to do it because it is expensive. Um, <clears throat> I think some feedlots can. I know some can and some can't. The, the jury's probably out. Um, but if it can improve mortality rates, morbidity rates by more than what it's worth, well then it's worth doing. What we found was that it was sort of a 50-50. If it cost us $20 a head to do the pre-treatment, we were probably saving 20. It was a line ball. Um, so we probably put the pressure back on ourselves to try to improve what we were doing and what we could control on our end of the business. So yeah, I'd say from my point of view, it's a 50-50. Dave, if you had Myers from the Weekly Times, I was really interested to hear you say load the cattle full. Yeah. And that to me seems to go against everything we've heard with livestock transporters and their code of practice in terms of loading empty and being empty for a certain amount of time. What's their reaction from the transporters and and does this go against what they're trying to promote in terms of loading animals that have at least been emptied for some amount of time so that they, they say that they travel better? Yeah. I know they've always, <coughs> I've had it drummed into me, <coughs> excuse me, by my father Sandy for about 25, 30 years and we used to own trucks, you know, and we always encourage people to load full. Um, I think it's better for the animal personally. I know it's going against what they say and transport operators will say, oh, we don't want to load them full and I suppose the arrogant answer to that is, well, don't worry about it, there's plenty of blokes who will. Um, so, you know, you own the cattle. if. In our system, like I was speaking from that from our own personal experiences, it works for us. Um, we want cattle off feed for the least amount of time as possible. You know, if I'm going to drive from Melbourne to Sydney, I don't starve myself the night before and then get in the car and drive to Sydney. You know, it's like running a marathon for them, trying to do it on an empty stomach. You know, I, I think we feel that, you know, loading cattle full, it doesn't have to be, you know, straight out of the paddock full. They might rest for we're especially fans of resting cattle for at least an hour, a couple of hours before they travel. If you run them straight in, they do tend to be pretty antsy and wild. And I also think it comes down to your animal handling and husbandry and those sorts of things. If you run them straight in out of the paddock and then rush them up and try to rush them on the truck, well, nobody's going to travel well. It's like you running five kilometres, jumping in your car and then driving to Melbourne. Well, it's <coughs> going to take you to Albury until you actually settle down a bit and get the heart rate down. So. I think there's a lot more to it than just not just loading cattle, not loading them full and not loading them empty. Um, you know, I'm sure the Livestock Associate Transport Associations have done a lot of trials and testing too, and across the board that may be what they think is best, but for, as far as our system is concerned, we prefer them full. And you're getting paid on an empty weight, so the less time you've got them off feed, you know, typically, the more weight you're going to have in them. Because cattle, I think, do lose more than 5%. I know anybody from, who sends cattle from southern feedlots into sort of, from southern Vic to southern to northern New South Wales, I would understand. What I'm saying is that cattle probably lose 7 or 8% over that time, not 5 um, So by loading cattle full, we'll minimise time off feed. Thanks, Dave. I know there are other questions. question is out there. Um, Unfortunately, we've got a bit moving, but yeah. uh, thank you very much for no a very insightful talk. Pleasure. Yeah. Thanks,